Um, thanks uh, for inviting me and um, thanks for those two great talks we had already. Um, of course, there will be some overlap, um, but um, it, it mixes all nowadays, so it, it's not really a matter um, or it's, it's not a problem. But um, let me just start with, with my company, um, ThyssenKrupp Ude, which we're now uh, named again, Ude, is over 100 years old. We turned 100 last year. And this is the first picture um, of his staff that uh, Mr. Ude, who is, who is in the, shown here in the center, um, had taken. And uh, we're fairly proud of the old history and trying to bring this um, legacy to the next step, which then, of course, means going into a greener future. And I'm coming, as you heard from my title, um, the operating unit is called fertilizer and methanol. So it contains those two products. And on the right hand side, you can see the methanol, but you also see the ammonia, which is for a base chemical produced from methane um, and then further transferred into um, fertilizers like urea, like nitrates, phosphate, etc. And those were our clients until a few years ago. And all of a sudden, those, those green thinking came along and it felt like all of a sudden, because then we were contacted by a totally new range of customers, new clients, energy clients, energy companies, energy suppliers, etc. So what we have now is that we are not only a fertilizer offering company, but also a green energy um, company. And that's how we created our um, main um, topic or the, 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 the sentence we follow is that we are, create, uh, we are creating a livable planet. And as you all know, chemical plants are mostly um, fairly not green, but we try our best in our whole portfolio to get the best out of the plants. And that's what we want to do. And that's what we are aiming for. Today, we're going to talk only about green ammonia. And um, as it has been said that green ammonia is one, um, one part of the net zero world and uh, many countries, the EU has the Green Deal, uh, Japan and Korea are releasing new, uh, new CO2 uh, reducing um, um, comments and politics all over the world are decided to go green or green now. So on one hand, we have the shift that the fertilizer, again fertilizer, is, is facing a greener future, not only from the feed, but also the product in the end. But um, we're focusing today, of course, on the green energy. And it has been mentioned, so ammonia, what, what will ammonia be a part of? And we actually, as, as, as if you had before, we've discussed um, before, it won't be only ammonia, and it won't be only methanol, and it won't be only hydrogen, but ammonia is one of the best um, products you can produce if you want it as a hydrogen carrier. A nice energy density, no, no need for cooling down and pressurizing as deep as for hydrogen, easy to ship. There is some infrastructure, for example, in the US and um, also in the Middle East. So all this is already in, in certain regions in place and can be used and can be copied. Um, Maritime fuel, if you've ever been to, to, um, to a harbor or been on a cruise ship, you see what it blows out um, and it's horrible. And hopefully this will be also a push that this industry had um, signed to decarbonize its ships. We will see. Um, I, don't, I don't never expect someone to accept the smell of ammonia on a cruise ship, but on, on bigger um, transport ships, that might be um, a possible scenario. And power generation as well. Japan and Korea are talking about coal firing, so they already do coal fire coal fired energy generation with ammonia. And um, obviously, if you generate hydrogen from ammonia, you have a further step and you lose um, efficiency. So the best would be a direct firing. But let's continue the way. You've seen the um, I've seen a map earlier. This is what it would mainly be. It will be the southern hemisphere that has the renewables, will provide the energy to the northern hemisphere. And uh, this path and path is um, the topic of this presentation. Those paths will be established in the future. 
And of course, we have those paths from the Middle East going into, into the world with oil and gas. Um, but those ones here shown here are new. And all those countries shown with green, like Australia, Japan, India as well, it's, it's hidden behind the Middle East sign. South Africa, Brazil, Chile, we will need the lot to cover what's required for the future. And that brings to the challenges. So we need to establish infrastructures all over the world for the ammonia and methyl and hydrogen, etc. For ships, the utilization has to be de uh, decided on. Markets will be generated also with a, a CO2 market that has to be controlled. So otherwise, it's probably not worthwhile uh, transporting ammonia all around the world. Step back to the what I, what I, how I started with the fertilizers. So currently, the you have a two million tons installed capacity of ammonia worldwide, and it's fuel based. It's, it's from coming from um, from methane mainly, and you have a range from 600 to over 3,000 metric tons per day capacity. And those are normally custom tailor made, so whatever the customer wants is um, fulfilled. Expectations. Um, it has been mentioned before as well. Expectations for the upcoming market with green, not only gray, but green, is fairly huge and it's more than four times expected. And it will be renewable based. And we will have larger capacities than what we need for fertilizer now. Just a, a ballpark number, the fertilizer production worldwide is always expected to grow between 1% and 2%. We, want, we can't stop that because we need, still need to feed the world what we do. But when it comes to the energy, we have a total new range and um, there will be heaps of slices of the cake for all companies, I assume. A chain, a value chain, a path, whatever you want to call it, is, is what we, uh, what would we see developing all over the world. And we're in a lucky position to be able to provide the whole value chain. So if you start on the left hand side, you see the renewables, and our daughter company, Nuzera, is um, delivering the um, electrolyzer. And together with us, with the fertilizer division, we only do the ammonia plant, but of course we cooperate. We can provide those two combined plants. And so you get from renewables with water to the ammonia. We will have storages, um, ammonia storages, and um, it won't be any different to what you see nowadays when you look at uh, refineries, same tanks, you will have them filled with ammonia, not with oil or, or other products. So um, that will be it. And we provide those tanks as well. We've got nothing to do with the transport though. And it's always funny that it's more a cruise ship shown here, but we will have um, ships or it represents the long, long distance ammonia transportation. And reports show that roughly from 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers, um, the best thing and the cheapest thing you can do is to transport ammonia via ship. And you have that easily. If you go along the Australian um, East Coast, you have that and you just reach the top with your 2,000 kilometers. So it will happen. And when it then arrives in the, in the next harbor, wherever it may be, um, if you're not directly using it like Japan or Korea uh, are planning it, you need to do a cracking. You need to crack the ammonia again and of course, you have to put an energy to crack a molecule. This is going to be, uh, this is it. And you need to be aware that this energy also comes from a green, a green source. And from then on, you've got the hydrogen and then the sky is the limit. You can use whatever you want it for. And um, which I'm going to then um, deep down um, in the later stage. So back to the, those plants. So when we started off a few years ago, um, we had those small plants requested. So it's always also a good number always to remember that from 20 megawatts, 50 megawatts uh, metric tons per day ammonia are generated. So those were the first requests. And then all of a sudden it, it, it increased and we um, then modulized the 300 metric tons per day ammonia plant. And now it exploded and we're now talking about plants from um, thousand upwards metric tons per day. So this is fairly interesting and challenges in this, especially plant operating and, and, and those plants are, are visible here. So 
you, you're lucky if you've got the uh, hydro energy because that's more or less stable, but you have a wind that changes every day in strength and being available or not. And sun, you, are, you know, you have it during the night, you don't have it during the night, you have it during the day. So what do you do? You can optimize the storage of energy. One possibility is store the energy for those days, for the night and for the days where the wind is not optimum, at an optimum. And then you operate the ammonia plant. You also can produce more hydrogen and then start the ammonia plant and operate it from the hydrogen that you've got captured in storage. But let me tell you, those two storages, either, oh, is it energy or hydrogen, they're both fairly expensive. So there needs to be an optimum. So this is a huge challenge that the industry um, faces. Also, what it shows on the right bottom corner, optimizing turndown ratio. So um, the winter stops, the sun goes down, the electrolysis slowly uh, moves down to a lower capacity, but for chemical plant like the ammonia plant, it is a huge challenge to be, to be ready. So you have to cool down, you have to adapt all the, um, all the equipment, all the pumps, all the catalysts and all the heat exchangers to make it possible to go down as, uh, as low as possible to be able to be a 10 or even lower percentage of the capacity. And it looks nice on those pictures if you dig deeper and you see, ah, yeah, on the left-hand side, the greenish curve, oh, this is how the power is going to look like. And that's going into an electrolysis and those core technologies are shown in, in orange. So you have those fluctuations. And all the things in between have to be ready to cover uh, these two or this these fluctuating electricity power to um, accept or not to accept to to gain this stable operation of ammonia. And because this is what the customer wants, because then of course the next steps are easier to uh, to adapt to or uh, to integrate. So huge challenge in that case. And um, of course, as I've mentioned, uh, as my colleagues here have mentioned before, the utilization also is um, is a challenge. It's not as a big challenge as the cracking itself, which we are developing currently. But um, it's it's always it's also always possible to feed from chemical feedstock that probably doesn't need require that purity as clean as to be as clean as for fuel cell, where you have to have mainly only hydrogen, but Everything's possible. So whenever the, the cracked hydrogen is produced, um, it's possible to go and utilize it, whatever um, product you want to make from, from it. Many paths and many challenges arise, and um, there is not a one or a zero. So we have something in between. We have different colors of hydrogen, and we will have different products. And that's what it shows here. So the range will be from renewable to direct power usage, feeding into a natural grid by re-transverting into SNG. We're gonna have fertilizer, we're gonna have methanol, we're gonna utilize the CO2 from, from other um, emitting industries and then make methanol with the green hydrogen. So many paths, many challenges, and um, it seems like we're all happy that it's happening and um, we're ready to take it on. Thank you.